Now we turn our attention to discuss various blood vessels, starting with the arteries. You need to be able to describe their structure and function. So if we start with their structure, we say that arteries have a narrow lumen. This means that the hole that the blood flows through is very narrow, that's the lumen. Because of that, blood flows at high pressure, and to stop the blood vessels bursting, they need thick muscle and elastic fibre walls to withstand that pressure. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Arteries tend to be oxygenated. The exception here is the pulmonary artery, which takes blood from the heart back to the lungs. That is deoxygenated. Veins have a much wider lumen. Because of this, blood flow is much slower at much lower pressure, and therefore they have thinner walls made of muscle and elastic fibres. Because that blood flows at such low pressure, sometimes it has a tendency to back up and that's why it's a valve which ensure that blood flows in the correct direction. Veins tend to be deoxygenated, they contain no oxygen. The exception here is the pulmonary vein which transports oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart, specifically the left atrium. The capillaries now, these are much much smaller than arteries and veins. They're only one cell thick, they have thin walls to provide a short diffusion distance their walls have small pores that allows the movement of substances. Capillaries have a very large surface area to volume ratio. Pulmonary means relating to the lungs. Renal means relating to the kidneys. Hepatic means relating to the liver. Use these words to help you label the various blood vessels around the body. If the main artery coming from the heart is known as the aorta, it feeds out of the left ventricle. Any vessel coming off the aorta therefore must be an artery. So, the name of the vessel supplying the liver is the hepatic artery that supplies oxygenated blood to the liver. The vessel supplying oxygenated blood to the kidneys is the renal artery. Now if we turn our attention to blood vessels flowing away from organs, because these vessels will join the vena cava, they must be veins. Let's take the vessel leaving the liver, it must be the hepatic vein. The vessel leaving the kidneys must be the renal vein. Don't forget that the hepatic portal vein exists between the intestines and the liver. This will contain the highest concentration of glucose because it's coming from our gut. Do think about various other components of blood coming into and out of organs. It makes sense that blood going to the lungs must have the highest concentration of carbon dioxide, the lowest concentration of oxygen. Blood leaving the kidneys, remember the kidneys are an organ of excretion. Therefore, blood in the renal vein must be lowest in urea as that's been excreted in our urine. The heart is a muscular organ which helps to pump blood around the body. It's very important that it can do that because of what I've said previously. The blood transports a large number of very useful substances, the most useful of which is oxygen needed by cellular respiration. So in terms of the anatomy of the heart, it has four chambers, two atrium and two ventricles. Just be very careful when it comes to labelling the heart. The left and right sides are flipped compared with what you'd probably think and that's because if you picked up the diagram and popped it into your chest, that's how the heart would actually appear. So notice that you have the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right atrium and the right ventricle. The separation between the left and right side of the heart, it's called the septum. A septum simply means a wall of muscle, such as your septum in your nose here. It keeps the left and right hand sides of the heart totally separate. And the reason for that is it stops the mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. The left side of the heart contains oxygenated blood. That means blood containing oxygen. The right hand side contains deoxygenated blood. That means blood containing no oxygen. So that's your board layout of the heart. Next up you have vessels which supply the heart. Any vessel that comes into the heart is known as a vein. Any vessel which leaves the heart is known as an artery. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. Try and remember that those two A's come together. Right, let's get into the nitty gritty of the heart then. So we're gonna start with the left atrium. I've already told you that the left side of the heart is oxygenated. So where must that blood have come from? Well, oxygenation, gas exchange occurs at the lungs. So blood supplied to the left atrium comes from the lungs and the name of this vessel is the pulmonary vein. The left atrium contracts, forcing blood into the left ventricle. The left ventricle contracts, forcing blood into the main artery known as the aorta. This artery goes off and splits into smaller arteries supplying various organs and cells with oxygenated blood. The cells use up that oxygen in their respiration, so we say that the blood becomes deoxygenated. It obviously needs to return to the lungs in order to become oxygenated, but in order to do that, it needs to go to the heart first of all. 
It does this by traveling in the vena cava vein to the right atrium. The right atrium contracts, forcing blood into the right ventricle. The right ventricle contracts, forcing blood into the pulmonary artery. This blood is then returned to the lungs where it can pick up more oxygen. There are various valves to prevent the backflow of blood in the heart. Between the walls of the left atrium and the left ventricle, you'll find the bicuspid valves, the left atrioventricular valves, they're both names for the same thing. And then in the walls between the right atrium and the right ventricle, you'll find the tricuspid valve, the right atrioventricular valves. These prevent backflow of blood back into the atrium. At the base of the pulmonary artery in the aorta, you have what's known as semilunar valves. These valves prevent backflow of blood into the ventricles. Remember, it's important that the left and the right-hand side of the hearts are separate in order to prevent oxygenated and deoxygenated blood from mixing, as this would result in lower rates of respiration. We say that the human heart is a double circulatory system. The reason for this is that blood enters the heart twice for every one circulation around the body. If you look more closely at the anatomy of the heart, you'll notice that the wall of the left ventricle is thicker than the wall of the right ventricle. Why is this? Well, that thickness means that there's more muscle. And the reason why the left ventricle needs more muscle is it needs to generate a higher pressure to force blood much further around the body. Whereas remember, the right ventricle is simply pumping to the lungs. How is the pulse rate created? Remember I said the pulse rate is the same as the heart rate. Well, blood leaves the heart in short bursts, causing the stretching to the wall of the aorta. When the ventricle relaxes, stretches of the aorta recoil, which increases the pressure within the aorta. Next up, the coronary arteries. Now, the heart is the hardest working muscle in the body. It contracts myogenically all by itself throughout your lifetime. Now, the heart needs a huge amount of oxygen in order to carry out those contractions, and that's the role of the coronary arteries, which snake over the outside of the heart. The coronary arteries supply the heart with its own oxygen requirements. Now, what happens if you lead a fairly unhealthy lifestyle? If you eat too much saturated fat, potentially smoking, it can be caused by stress. It can even be hereditary, so caused by genetic factors. But what may occur is that fatty deposits may build up in the lining of the coronary arteries. This narrows the lumen of the artery, meaning that less oxygenated blood reaches the heart muscle cells. As a result of this, aerobic respiration can no longer occur, more anaerobic respiration occurs, leading to the buildup of lactic acid, and fundamentally the heart muscle cells die. There are various treatment options for coronary heart disease, including a stent. Here you have a small metal meshwork which is placed in the occluded artery. There's a balloon inside the meshwork which gets inflated, forcing that meshwork to open up that artery. Then the balloon is removed and you've still got that meshwork in place holding open the coronary artery. This obviously requires intense surgery. It's quite a dangerous operation. It is a long-term solution, but there's always the risk of pathogen entry as soon as you make an incision in the body. If complete heart failure has occurred, then someone will require a heart transplant. The problem with this is they obviously come from other humans. You need a heart of exactly the right size and there is always a shortage of heart transplant. In the meantime, an artificial transplant can be used. This is made up of plastic, fibres and metal alloys. An artificial heart is not a long-term solution. Ideally, you would require a human transplant, but remember there's always issues with rejection when tissues don't match, blood groups don't match. The person will require immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of their life in order to stop the heart from being rejected. Remember that rejection occurs because there are antigens, small proteins, on the side of the new person's heart. These get recognised by the person whose body it's going into. Lymphocytes and antibodies are produced in order to attack the antigens on that new heart. Hence, it's the lymphocytes which need suppressing. Another option could be a heart bypass, where effectively a new vessel is fashioned, redirecting blood away from the blockage in the coronary artery. Statins are a drug used to treat coronary heart disease. They work by lowering blood cholesterol, which is also a contributing factor to coronary heart disease. Statins work by inhibiting an enzyme involved in the production of cholesterol. Sometimes they ask you to compare the relative advantages and disadvantages of statins versus heart transplant. Use your common sense here. The advantage of statins is obviously that they're cheaper, they're more readily available, they're easier to take, there's no major operation. Problems include the fact that someone might actually forget to take them and there could be possible side effects. Another potential treatment option includes plant stenol esters. 
Plant sternal esters have a very similar structure to cholesterol. They help to lower blood cholesterol in our bodies, therefore reducing the risk of coronary heart disease. There are several different heart diseases. Obviously, we've mentioned coronary heart disease. What about angina? Well, angina is pain in the heart caused by coronary heart disease. Beta blockers are a type of drug which may be used to treat angina. Beta blockers work by binding to adrenaline receptors, meaning that adrenaline can no longer bind. Remember, one effect of adrenaline is to increase the heart rate. So if the adrenaline binding sites have been bound to, it means that adrenaline can no longer take effect, the heart rate can no longer be increased. So beta blockers, in essence, lower the heart rate. Moving on to blood pressure now, two types of blood pressure, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Systolic is the highest blood pressure reached. The systolic pressure is caused when the left ventricle contracts and the normal range for systolic heart pressure is between 100 and 140 millimeters of mercury. The diastolic pressure is the lowest pressure caused when the ventricles relax and your usual range for diastolic blood pressure is between 60 and 90 millimeters of mercury. Hypertension is the term used to describe chronic high blood pressure. Lots of reasons for hypertension. It, it could include stress, obesity, smoking. Again, it could be hereditary caused by genetic factors, drinking alcohol, high levels of salt in the diet. Treatment options for hypertension include beta blockers again, which remember lower the heart rate. ACE inhibitors, remember ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, as well as consuming a healthy diet and taking plenty of exercise. So ACE inhibitors, now angiotensin converting enzymes are responsible for producing angiotensin. Angiotensin narrows blood vessels, therefore increasing blood pressure. So therefore, if you think about it, ACE inhibitors, ACE inhibitors prevent angiotensin being made, therefore meaning that less blood vessel narrowing occurs, meaning that blood pressure is effectively reduced.